and it's Spirit River. Here is Barry Geraghty again following up Big Zeb's win and Spirit River wins the Coral Cup. And a battle royal here for the Green Mother champion chase. Brilliant Rainbow will take the title and beat Sizing Europe. And as far as Henderson and Geraghty are concerned on Ladies' Day, you can't beat that. It's three as the gelding in the colours of Michael Buckley takes the set and novices hurdle. Brain Power is a very smart horse indeed. Brain Power takes the international hurdle. Constitution Hill, the colours of Michael Buckley, trained by Nicky Henderson, ridden by Nico de Boinville, a very easy winner of the Unibet Tolworth hurdle. And that's before we even talk about all those great horses in the 70s, 80s and 90s. That's just the most recent chapter, Michael Buckley. Good morning. Good morning, Nick. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. And uh, how does this compare, the lead up to Cheltenham this year, the build up to Constitution Hill, the first race, a horse that you know, everyone has warmed to so much? How does it compare to all those great highlights? Well, it's been an extraordinary thing because for some reason, and I couldn't tell you exactly why, he's captured people's imagination in a way that none of the other horses had. Um, I mean, the last time that I spoke to you before Cheltenham, oddly enough, was when um, Finian's Rainbow was going to the Arkle and um, Spirit's Son for, the, for this race, the, um, the first race. Um, and that was sort of quite interesting because you dragged me off for the morning line, I remember, yeah. um, down at Cheltenham on the first day. But for some reason or other, all sorts of people who I've never spoken <laughs> to before have rung up and asked to talk to me or find out what I thought or some article in their own breeder I've never spoken to before. It's just interesting that this this horse, for, and I don't know where the vibe comes from exactly. Maybe it was Ruby Walsh who was meant to be commentating on a race in Ireland summer which went off late. And when he was asked what he'd think of the finish, in, in his first race, he said, sorry, I was watching this horse at Sandown coming up the hill, and they don't often come up the hill to the finish line in that sort of way. So, But anyway, it's fun. I guess, knowing me, it's a bit stressful. Um, and it's exciting. Is part of the reason why you, you're still doing this, why you're still earning racehorses, is because you actually enjoy the stress of it a little bit. You, you sort of enjoy the ride. Well, I, I think I like... I wouldn't like to have a, a com completely placid life. I don't think that would suit my temperament. I mean, sometimes when I've been to medical things or I hadn't been feeling too hot and you go to the doctor, they said, you know, are you very stressed? And I said, well, I hope I'm a bit stressed because that's what I enjoy. I like a, a bit of an edge in things. So, um, so partially that. Um, I think I bought this horse in a way. Well, first of all, Barry had talked about him to me some long time before he came up from set for sale and you know he'd imagined by then he'd have won a point to point and would have been sold and I wasn't really looking for a horse um, and then the point to points were cancelled and things didn't work out quite as he'd hoped for the horse um, and I think it was thinking about Nicky and my life together one day and I thought it'd be nice to have another horse because uh, brain power had been retired, he had an overreach, and I had two other horses that hadn't run at all during last season, and so the future for my s string was two no-hopers. Uh, well, not quite two no-hopers, one was sold, and that was a sad story because I owned it in partnership with Sam Vesti, so he sadly had, had passed away during the year, so that, and he wasn't very good, so he went to the sale. And I thought, give it another roll of the dice with Nicky, you know, we're, we're both getting on a bit and getting a bit more frail, I suppose. <laughs> well, he, poor thing, as he talks about his eyesight's not so hot. Um, and we look like we've got lucky, at least we know he's a good horse anyway. Just a question of how good he might be. We'll talk more about Constitution Hill a little bit later, but I want to dial it right back to, to your, your very early days as a, as a racehorse owner, because that I don't know so much about. Sort of right back to, what, 74, when you were very young, first foray into it, what, what made you do it? I, I guess that um, I used to sneak off from the office when I was an article clerk and go to Plumpton on Monday afternoons, and I must have had a winning bet, and I thought, I like winning 
have been winning bets because we earned next to no money. I mean, it wasn't long after when you went to a firm, you were supposed to pay them so they could use you as slave labor for five <laughs> years. So I, and then I grew up on a farm and my brother's great friend who was a local corn merchant and so he bought the produce from the farm, well, the corn, but also my brother bought all his fertilizers and cattle feed and so forth. So he used to go to Cheltenham, so he took me to Cheltenham and I thought this was such good fun. But it was really about the experience and having a bet when I was a kid, because I didn't... Um, I, I remember going one bank holiday to um, Fontwell in May, and I was probably earning about five pounds a week at the time. And uh, things had gone very, very badly. I maybe had <laughs> two five pound notes and I'd lost the first one. We came to the last race and there was a, sh a horse ridden by Josh Gifford, trained by Ryan Price, which was about three to one on. And I thought, I've got to get some of this <laughs> money back. So I put a five pound bet on the tote for a place. Desperation. Desperate people do some stupid things, if not desperate. Anyway, the horse was well beaten and the winner had gone past the post and the second had gone past the post and in the distance after the last fence was Josh Gibbard taking, taking absolutely no interest in this race at all <laughs> and I saw some desperate <laughs> figure behind him whipping his horse as hard as he could to try and get third place and there is this lone figure screaming down the race course, look over your shoulder, look over your shoulder and anyway that was a sort of how I began and it was an inauspicious beginning. It wasn't great, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but it was fun, and somehow or another, I thought, these are wonderful animals. You kind of... I just got to think that I might love horses, and so some kids, they want to have a ra you know, a sports car when they start having a car. I just thought I'd love to have a, a, have a, a horse, and I went to a stable near Lambord in Sparshall, where Peter Bailey trained with a pal of mine who had horses there, so he bought me this X-flat horse. And as I've said before, the worst possible thing that could happen did happen. Um, that it, in its first race at Windsor, it won. Um, and actually, there's this very, very old friend of mine who I'll know will be watching called Colin Kennard, who watches all my races, bless him. And he came with me, and I remember when this horse crossed the line, I turned around, and there he was in tears. Anyway, he had more tears later because we went to the bar and I think we came out about two and a half hours later. And in those days, there, was, there were no ballots. You just went on till everyone wanted to run and had a run. Yeah. So I think there were 14 races that day. Because they'd just divide and divide and divide. Divide and divide and divide, divide, and divide till everybody wanted to run, had a run. So we'd been drinking for hours and came out and there's still about four races to go. So it was a long, happy day. Uh, such a happy day. And you hadn't made it big by then, had you? You hadn't made your first fortune so you <laughs> well I don't I don't know if I ever had a fortune because I made any money it all disappeared on horses so what might have become a fortune suddenly went off and buying horses in a sort of mad dash for a buzz but w what struck me was when you said you know some people will go out and buy a sports car I went out, out and bought a horse now quite a lot of people would still go out and buy a sports car even if they didn't really have the money to buy it relatively few people now in their 20s early 20s as you were then would go out and buy by a racehorse. It was it's kind of a quite a cool, quite raffish thing to do, even then, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I grew up on a farm, so horses were around. The hunt would come by. I mean, I was, we were never involved in, oh, I wasn't anyway, in riding horses. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was nuts, but I guess some people who've, well, you've known me a long time, I, I, I do have some eccentricities, and that was one of them. <laughs> It, it struck me that that early part, I mean, this is a bit that I don't remember, the early part of when you were running racehorses, it, it was all quite straightforward. You were just winning big race after big race, a Hennessy, a Whitbread. What, did you not win two big races either side of the Atlantic on the same day? Yeah, in 1976, I, I was in Camden, South Carolina, where this horse I owned half of, Grand Canyon, had been invited to run in the Colonial Cup. Um, and then a horse that Peter Bailey trained won Zeta's son won the Hennessy the same morning, and we then, Pat Samuel and this horse, who ran in his colours, and I'd bought half of it at a lunch I, where I, I met him, actually. Um, and he owned Captain Christie that won the, the uh, Gold Cup. And he said to me, all my horses are for sale. I said, well, you mean you'd sell Captain Christie? He said, if somebody offered enough money. I said, seems a bit cold-blooded. He said, but they can all go wrong. Anyway, I bought half of this horse, 
Grand Canyon had been winning novice hurdles by about 30 lengths. Um, and I remember from him, I wasn't at all certain how I was going to pay the £10,000 it cost, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and on that afternoon, he rang me up and he said, do you remember what I said about setting Captain Christie? I said, yeah. He said, I've just had a phone call from Pat Taff and he's got a leg and he won't run in the Gold Cup. He said, that's my point, that um, you need to look at it objectively and so forth. Anyway, it, I haven't been very objective about horses in that sort of sense, I don't think. Um, but I'd never been to America, so the first time I went was when Mrs. DuPont Scott, who'd won the Grand National with Battleship, um, which Bruce Hobbs rode, I believe. I remember seeing him at six foot something and thought, however, did he ride around the Grand National and win it? Um, but On she, a horse, he was about 14 too, wasn't he? Yeah, Battleship. absolutely, min minuscule, yeah, very aptly named. <laughs> he, um, so we went there and they paid for everything. Uh, the horse, the jockey, the trainer, the stable lad, but not the owner. So Pat and I were both slightly short of money, so we scrambled together the, the airfares and met in Camden. And then that evening at a party, he said, have you ever been to Las Vegas? I said, I've never been to America before. So we headed off, and I'd done all my studying, pretty much listening to Elvis Presley. I mean, what I really wanted to do as this kid in the country was be Elvis Presley. That's what I'd love to have done much more fun than doing painful, boring articles in an accountancy firm. Could you sing? Oh, I was absolutely sensational. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it would have been unfair. <laughs> Think of all the people who wouldn't have had a career if I'd appeared on stage. Um, <laughs> I used to sing. Then, of course, through racing, I met all these fun people like Robert Sangster. And I remember going to this Barbados tour golf tournament afterwards, which he and John Magnus started, and there were these parties. And there was always a fight between Theo Fenella and me to grab the microphone, um, as to because we both liked to sing. He was much better than me, and he also, of course, had the kudos that he was always selling things from his from his shop to Elton John and others. So, but I met a lot of people through racing, and, and it was what my life would have been like without having had this what became a passion for horses, who I found that I loved very much. Um, I just no idea because it's been such a big part of my life. So is everything that you've done been informed by this desire to escape the mundane, to escape being bored? Are you, are you someone with a very yeah? I think a lot of span? I, I think uh, I don't know if it's an attention span, but um, you need to be entertained. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's a sort of strange blood mix. I don't know, half Irish, half Hungarian. Maybe it's. Uh, the, the people that actually produced me were creative people, so I think that I was a sort of frustrated writer or something, and and a lot of other things that I enjoy are creative interests, movies and plays and books and so on. So I don't know what it is, but you you can't have a better time than hang out with some of these people. I mean, you've met dozens of them, and you know yeah. it's a fun environment. And if you've grown up in a very pretty modest you know, little farm in Sussex, and there was nothing as exciting as this, and then you meet a man like Sanks who's winning derbies and stuff. I mean, it's fairly uh, heady stuff. Well, it's, it's quite interesting, that, because um, you were adopted. And yeah. so you, you, as you say, your, your birth parents were Hungarian and, and Irish. So your yeah. birth father was Hungarian, mother yeah, Irish? Yeah, he was a sculptor, yeah. Yeah, and, so, and then you go to something quite, quite sort of quiet and steady and well I was dead, I was dead lucky I mean I yeah you know the where I ended up with this wonderful mrs. Buckley I was incredibly fortunate because otherwise it would have been the Battersea dogs home so things could have been a lot worse than they were and she, and I the family there couldn't have been more wonderful to me and treated me exactly as one of their own um, but my blood mix was slightly different, mm. and it wasn't really attuned, I don't think, to um, trudging around in the sort of deep mud of Sussex, trying to scratch a living out of on bad land as they were doing poor things. So I thought, I, when I had the courage, I got out of there and tried something else. And nor being an article clerk, for that matter. Oh, God, I hated that. I mean, it was during the time of those articles that I think my character changed because of my background, in a way. I was very shy before that. 
Um, so but, you, so you, but I've but tried to cover up how shy I am, particularly with people like you when you're interviewing me. <laughs> so you felt that actually your sort of DNA was starting to come through? Yeah, I think, it, I think that's exactly right. And you started to express yourself? I didn't yourself. think this conversation would go down this road, but anyway, yeah, what, you, here you, we are. You haven't watched this programme before, have you? <laughs> no, never, never. <laughs> um, talk to me about the beginning of the relationship with Nicky Anderson and how you found each other. I had lunch with him on Friday. Um, he had to come up to London for something, and we had a lunch afterwards. And I said, uh, I said to him, when did you start training? He said, 1978. He looked about 12 years old when I first met him. And I think I must have met him hanging around with, with Robert Sangster and that group of people that he had, like Charles Benson and so forth, who I know used to stay with Nicky a lot. Um, probably m most people who watch this program would never have heard of Charles Benson, but he was a a writer and a sort of larger-than-life character. Was he the sort of jester at court? The yes. sort of writer, yeah. bon viveur... R Robert loved having, Hunter, uh, loved having these kind of extraordinary characters around um, to entertain him, and Charles was a very large bon viveur, and then he had a, a, another court jester called Billy MacDonald, who had... Uh, I think he, he, he went to California to sell cars, and then he bought, alleged for Robert, who won a couple of Arc de Triomphes, and then he self-styled himself as a purveyor of champions to multimillionaires. <laughs> Bless him. I love Billy. Um, completely mad. And he, he had this whole court of entertaining people and obviously very good trainers and then obviously the Irish connection with Coolmore. So I met all these people and, um, I mean, I was talking to JP the other day. He remembers that we met first in a, in a hotel in Aintree in 1976. So I've known them all a long, long time. And as I said, I don't know what my life would have been like other, otherwise if I hadn't bought that funny little, not particularly attractive horse called Game Moss. You talk a lot about uh, the proclamation, and, and everybody's quite familiar with the, the story now, this, this brilliant racehorse who ultimately was, was killed in a fall at Ascot, and, and how that sort of affected you. Um, how might your your life in owning racehorses have been different were it not for that experience, do you think? Um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if it's affected my life in racehorses uh, at all really. I mean it's um, one part of you is saddened and uh, well more than saddened, absolutely heartbroken. Um, and um, I, I, I've, I've kind of slightly overdone talking about mm. the, the heartbreaks you can get from this. I mean, I suddenly had a flash through my mind of Zeta's son breaking a leg in the Grand National when he, Ron Barry, who was meant to ride him, thought he would win the race. And, um, and Ron had written for, ridden for Gordon Richards in those days, and Gordon said, your owner's behind a stand up there sobbing his eyes out, you better go and get hold of him. Um, and I've overdone all this because actually what you think about with races is the happy days. I mean, it sounds, makes me sound a bit over maudlin talking about all this stuff, but people think that it's all a bed of roses. You win some races, you have some nice horses, and everyone thinks that's how life is. But I, I suppose I, I, well, it might have done people some good to know there's some other side, side of it. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to overdo it. I don't think it affected me. Probably made me think I need to find another one and as good. And it's a hard search because really, really exceptional horses, as everybody knows, are incredibly hard to find. Yeah, you have found quite a lot of uh, really talented, well, really I've, exceptional horses. Yeah, I've, well, I've had a lot of good horses. That, that extra little bit of... I don't know, well in a human you'd say it was genius, whatever it is in a horse, ability is rare. I mean, it's, um, I mean, if you look at what Nick has had in the last few years, I mean, you'd say Shishkin has it, Altior had it, and uh, Sprinter Sacra had it. They're, they're just horses that have that little bit of extra and um, keeps them going, so. Honeysuckle's got it. You know, there's lots, there's, uh, all trainers, deserve one of those horses because they know that how good it might be and it should keep them going because I think that training is a tough game for people and if you have 
endless moderate horses, which is what most of them are, mm. it can be a bit heartbreaking, I imagine. So, uh, I promise you, I, I I want to talk about Tuesday and no, and beyond, okay. but I I do I, I do just want to pick up on something there, and it's really sort of what what makes you tick as an owner now, and and what motivates you in in light of the fact that say a decade ago you got pretty heavily stuck in and had a whole load of horses, and you were kind of one of these sort of super owners. You, you see the white and black pretty much every day, but I got the sense that that didn't really turn you on that much. Well, it would have turned me on if there'd been enough of them had been any good. They were mostly useless. <laughs> I mean, it's all very well. I am, but I sold a business in 2009, and so you know how it is. You had a bit of luck, and um, so someone says, I've got this horse. You think, oh, yeah, it's a great game, isn't it? Yeah, buy another one and another one. And all of a sudden, I had about 18 horses of Nicky. I, and, but... Other than Spirit Sun, who had a short but brilliant career, and um, Finian's Rainbow, who won the champion chase in 2012, who, kept, who was in that group, but nothing else did any good at all. Yeah. I mean, I won that, they won on little races, but they were so disappointing. And that is a perfect example how tough it is. You go off, I mean, I'm not going to... I'm not blaming Anthony Bromley, but a lot of them came from France and he found them, and we thought they were all good when we bought them, but the fact is that the majority of horses are, are average to disappointing, and that's, I always say, well, isn't that how humans are, in a way? I mean, <laughs> Average to disappointing. Well, we really, you know how, what I mean, there's not... Not that many exceptional ones. There aren't really, no. You are, you're one. Oh, but. stop it now. Right, so... <laughs> the, well, the experiential part of this is is the other interesting bit, isn't it? Because in the 70s, you've gone and done the Colonial Cup thing um, you know, when you've never been to America before and you've had this wild day. You win with your first horse at Windsor, your friend's in tears. You know, you've had the experience of the champion chase with Fidian's Rainbow and then you have Toast of New York. I mean, it's nearly the ultimate experience that I don't know how many you got racked up thirty-six thousand air miles in a year and got beaten that far in a Breeders' Cup. Well, he was that he just was doesn't amazing. happen. That doesn't happen to anyone really. That kind of thing. Well, you know how people, Richard Pittman, in the days when he was doing your job, as it were, always used to call me Lucky Buckley, and I used to say to him even back then, back in the seventies, there's an awful lot of horses that I have you never hear about, you know. Because he would always say when I had a winner, Lucky Buckley strikes again. Yeah. I mean, I love Richard. He was a nice, nice man. But, I mean, this, this was one of the great days of all time. I mean, I, I still find this hard to believe now. You get caught up in it then, back in 2014. But to get, to get this close with a horse... Nostril. And then he was in front, and then probably California Crane would have overtaken him. And then the Stewards' Inquiry. And the stewards' inquiry and dear Jamie, well, the two dear Jamies, but Jamie Spencer sitting on that horse waiting for five minutes to find out if he'd won or not. I was so excited and thrilled when uh, that he'd run so well, and it was it was only afterwards that I thought I felt some disappointment that he hadn't won. And then when I went back to Santa Anita, I was really disappointed because they've got a board with the winners on, and I thought. It would have been so cool to see Toast of New York up there, particularly as a race in America, the biggest race of the of the season. And for a, for an American race, he was so kind of perfectly named by chance. So that's the thing. It's that that's the experience bar, just set almost to the max there. For Constitution Hill to to hop over that bar and to become this great this this horse with <laughs> the the X factor, the next Prince of Sacra, whatever. Does that then suddenly become the pinnacle of your experience in horse racing? Well, life's a moving feast, Nick, isn't it? I mean, you can't go on and on. At least, I don't think one should, but people do go hark back to what happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. You have to think about what's going on now. So if he turns out to have that X factor, um, and we might, we might not find out on Tuesday, he might possess it and something might go wrong. What do you feel? What do you feel? What do you think? You've seen enough horses. You've been close to Nicky Henderson for long enough. What do I think about this horse? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I got I got told off the other evening because um, Matt Chapman rang me up for a chat on his show, and I was standing in the street for 25 minutes, 
And then when I went to a pre-Cheltenham dinner, somebody said, you sound really, really down on this horse's chances. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I listened to that interview, you know, kept saying, well, this might go wrong, that might go wrong. And I said, well, what do you expect me to do? Go on there and see he's a certainty. So, and just say, that's it, I'm off. Um, he's, he's got a lot of plus, pluses. He he's, can obviously travel well in a race. I mean, this is heavy ground, so um, it'll be different to this. Um, he seems to jump pretty well. Um, he can quicken. I mean, he can, he's. I think the previous race, um, where I think the first time he won, mm -hmm. I read in the Racing Post that it was a two-day meeting and he did a time um, over that trip. And one would have, and the ground was getting worse on Saturday than Friday. That he was eight or nine seconds faster than any other. Yeah. I think a uh, hurdle race, and he also quickened in the last two furlongs. So he's got a kick, he seems to stay well, he travels well, and probably his best weapon for next Tuesday is actually that he's got such a good temperament. He doesn't, so far, nothing's phased him, rather the reverse, he seems sort of extraordinarily laid back. So I hope that he'll get through the preliminaries better than some of the others. So I think he's got a big shot. What do you think he might do after Cheltenham? If, uh, well, if all this well. season? Yeah. Well, there aren't too many alternatives. I mean, he's, um, I mean, one of the routes you can go is obviously Aintree, um, which is quite a tight track and it might be a bit, the ground might be a quick, quick. If there's only Aintree or Punchestown. Now, if he happened I loved sort of doing the unconventional. In 1976, mm -hmm. I had said to Peter Bailey, I had a horse called Strombolus, and I said, uh, let's run him in the Whitbread. And he said, but he's a novice. I said, sure, okay, let's put him in a field, bring him back next October. What will he be then? He won't be a novice. It's just the same thing. And he won. Uh, I sound like a smart ass, but I mean, that is the <laughs> truth. And I did it with my pal, uh, I made the same suggestion with Brown Windsor, who Nicky trained, which mm -hmm. I owned with Bill Shan Kidd. 89. And um, the same thing happened. So what would I like to do? I mean, if he happened to win, he was impressive. Um, it would be super fun to go and try and win the champion hurdle in Punchestown, um, particularly if Honeysuckle wins at Cheltenham, just to find out how good he is. You know, it would, I, that would be a real thrill. Always seeking the next adventure. And anyway, I owe, I owe um, Henry one because we had t a tussle at um, Cheltenham in the champion chase with Sizing Europe and Finian's Rainbow. And I made a joke afterwards, which I was meant to be a light-hearted remark, and it, which was that somebody said, well, you did the f last fence help you to win? And I just smiled and said, well, Barry said we'd have won further without having to go around the fence. And it, when it was printed in the newspaper, it looked so arrogant and awful that I'd never met Henry. So I made a point of Punchestown of going to apologise because I said I didn't really mean it to come out the way it did. But it would be nice to have another tussle with him, but we'll see. Anyway, we, listen, next Tuesday, it sounds I'm getting well ahead of myself. <laughs> next Tuesday is what it's all about. <laughs> and um, and uh, I'll be devastated and heartbroken if he gets beaten 20 lengths, I'll tell you that. Um, I, really, I really hope now the he wins and honeysuckle wins, so this match is on. In the ah, role, well, in listen, the it's got the horse has got to be fine, yeah. and also there's somebody involved in this who's got to agree to do such a crazy thing, which is Mr. Henderson. Good so. job he's not watching; he's walking the course at Cheltenham. <laughs> he'll never, he'll never know anything about it. In the um, in the extraordinary roller coaster of your racing life, it strikes me that you could just be about to um, to get on the Big Dipper. So, good luck with the next adventure. Well, I well, I hope it's on the bit that goes up, not the yeah. bit that goes down. Absolutely. Michael Buckley, thank you very much. My pleasure. It's really nice to see you. Thanks. Michael Buckley, whose Constitution Hill will be uh, one of the key horses as the Cheltenham Festival opens up uh, just 48 hours from now.